So an individual inherits two of the recessive alleles as described as homozygous recessive. And an individual who has one of the dominant alleles and one of the recessive alleles is described as heterozygous. And if you just cross out the word recessive, that's an error. Heterozygous or carrier. All right, well, before you know, uh, I go any further, I want to give you some examples of what I mean. So why don't we turn to page N6. N6. And you might say, what page? N6. And your first thought is, there's nothing there. Exactly. So we're going to look on page N6. Now, I'm going to talk about eye color. Eye color is hardly the most important characteristic. You know, of, uh, and per perhaps, it, arguably, it's one of the least important characteristics. Furthermore, uh, we don't fully even understand the complete genetics about eye color. But I'm going to use eye color because it's an easy trait to talk about, you know, brown eyes and blue eyes. All right, we can talk about all kinds of other things, but they get more complicated. So let's just, uh, first some definitions. So we're going to use, we're going to represent a capital letter B to represent brown, the uh, gene for brown eyes. So this is the gene for brown eyes. And I'm making, I'm using a capital letter B because it's dominant. I think most of us are kind of familiar with this idea. Now we're going to use a small letter B to represent the gene for blue eyes. And I'm using a small letter B because it's recessive. All right, let's consider what the possibilities are as far as how this works. If somebody had, okay. if somebody inherited the gene for brown eyes from both parents, from both parents, so we would say they are homozygous dominant. And our first thought is, yeah, what's that mean? Homo means the same. They are the same for the dominant gene. They have inherited the dominant gene from both parents. All right, now what if they uh, had inherited the gene for blue eyes from both parents? Then they would be homozygous. You'd say, what does homo mean? The same for the recessive gene. All right, so they're homozygous for the recessive. They inherited the recessive gene from both parents. Now, there's only one other possibility. What if they inherited the dominant gene, brown eyes, from one of their parents, and the recessive gene for blue eyes from the other parent? Then we would say they are heterozygous. Hetero means mixed, other. Okay, they've got a gene, one of the brown genes for brown eyes and a gene for blue eyes, so it's not the same from both. It, they got two different genes from the different parents. All right, does everybody follow that so far? All right, let's, let's consider the following example then. So let's assume that we had a man, and we commonly represent the male by drawing a box, because I guess guys are blockheads. And uh, let's let's say that uh, let's say the man, his genetic makeup was homozygous dominant. That's the father. Okay, and then he's got a curvy wife. We draw the women, the females, as a curvy circle. All right. And let's imagine she's got blue eyes. All right? Not the most important concept in the world, but here's our question. Could a man with this genetic makeup, who has two, he's homozygous for the dominant brown eyes, 
and he's married to a woman who's recessive, uh, uh, homozygous recessive, who has the blue, blue eyes. And our question is, what kind of children could they have? Could they have a child with blue eyes? No. No. Okay, so the way we solve these things is we do a cute little game here. All right, the little game is called, it's uh, called a Punnett square. All right, so we're going to uh, basically do this. Now, if this is the man, all of his sperm will have to have the gene for brown eyes. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And so we, he only has genes for brown eyes. And all of the eggs produced by the woman will have eggs carrying the gene for blue eyes. That's all she has. So let's put, uh, we'll put the uh, male here and the female here. All of the sperm will have the gene for brown eyes. All of the eggs will have the gene for blue eyes. So all of their children will be heterozygous. You'd say, yeah, and so what does that mean? Well, that means that while they are heterozygous, every child, they will have brown eyes because the brown is dominant. That's what you see. So all their children would have brown eyes. The, uh, so the genotype, the genotype is big B, little b. They are carriers. The phenotype, phenotype is what you see. The phenotype would be brown eyes. All their children would have brown eyes. Everybody follow that? Does that make sense? All right, so it's very interesting. Here we have a man with brown eyes, a woman with blue eyes. All their children will be heterozygous, but have what will appear to be brown eyes. Let's try another possibility. What if we had a man who's heterozygous, and he marries a woman who's also heterozygous. Now, what color eyes does the man have? He's got brown eyes. What color does his wife have? She's got brown eyes. Because brown is dominant. But each one is a carrier of the blue eyes. Could they have a child with blue eyes? Yes. They could. So. The sperm, half the sperm produced by the man will have the gene for brown eyes, and half the sperm will have the gene for blue eyes. And the same thing is true with the eggs. Half the eggs will have the gene for brown eyes, and half the eggs will have the gene for blue eyes. So let's put this together into uh, a little puzzle here. All right, so half the sperm have the gene for brown eyes, half the sperm have the gene for blue eyes. Half the eggs have the gene for brown eyes and half have the gene for blue eyes. Does everybody see what I did here? I just redrew this right here. So what are the possibilities? If the sperm carrying the gene for brown eyes unites with the egg carrying the gene for brown eyes, and you get that. If the uh, sperm carrying the gene for brown eyes unites with the egg carrying the gene for blue eyes, you get this. We always write the capital letter before the small letter. If the sperm carrying the gene for blue eyes unites with the egg carrying the gene for brown eyes, it's this. Again, we write the capital letter before the small letter. And if the sperm carrying the gene for blue eyes unites with the egg carrying the gene for blue eyes, you get this. Now, what color eyes is this person? Brown. What color are these person's eyes? They're brown, although they're carriers of the gene for blue eyes. What color eyes are this person? 
blue. So there's a one in four chance, a one in four chance of this couple having a child with blue eyes. So here's what's really kind of interesting about genetics. You'd say, tell me, nothing's really that interesting at this point in the semester. Here's what's really interesting. In this example, we had a husband and a wife, and she had blue eyes, and there's no chance of them having a child with blue eyes. And here we have a couple where they both have brown eyes, and there's a one in four chance that they'll have a child with blue eyes. Because if this couple, even though they have brown eyes, they're each carriers of the recessive gene for blue eyes. So this is where you see somebody, you, you, you know, uh, you, you uh, see a family, and the both parents have brown eyes, and they've got one, and they got a child with blue eyes, and you say, "What's going on? You know, who is the mailman? Uh, you know, <laughs> what, what's going on there? How, how do, we get both the husband has brown eyes, the wife has brown eyes. How do they have a child with blue eyes? Because they could both be carriers of that gene for blue eyes. And then you've got this case here, where the wife's got blue eyes, one of them's got blue eyes." And they don't have, there's no possibility of having a child with blue eyes. You say, how can that be? Maybe if they have more children, they should, for sure, she's got blue eyes. They should be able to have a child with blue eyes. They can't, because the brown is dominant. The blue is there, but it's hidden by the darker brown. Huh? What about, uh, I've seen a few children and adults who have both, one brown and well, one blue. Well, so that's, obviously, that's something where the, the person is a carrier. Uh, a famous example is uh, Jane Seymour. She has actually a blue eye and a green eye. And that's because developmentally, it just they, they, one eye developed a little bit differently than the other. They should have both been the same color. Okay. There's all kinds of variations and so on. And uh, I'm keeping this really simple. I'm just talking about brown and blue. I'm not even throwing in green or haze or anything else. So, but I wanted to just show you this because people have noticed eye color and they're trying to figure out how could this possibly be and we're explaining <clears throat> how it could be. Uh, all right, so uh, does everybody follow how that works? So uh, again, in terms of the terminology, in terms of the terminology, the dominant gene uh, in this case was the brown eyes. Uh, so we use a capital letter, the recessive, was uh, blue, we used a small letter. Homozygous means the same. Hetero means different. Having a gene for brown eyes and blue eyes is heterozygous. They're also called carriers. Uh, homozygous dominant means they are the same for the dominant gene. Homozygous recessive, they're the same for the recessive gene. And we've shown you how to do this. Now, really, when we deal with genetics, we're not really normally that concerned about eye color, and we're not concerned about how tall we are or blood type. What we're really concerned about is genetic diseases. That's really what concerns parents. You know, parents might say, I hope we have a son, I hope we have a daughter, I hope they have blue eyes, I hope they have green eyes. But one thing when it really gets serious is they just hope they're healthy. That's really all that really matters. So I want to uh, just touch upon that. So when we look at page uh, N3, on N3, on N3 in the middle of the page, we mention genetic diseases. And most genetic diseases are caused by an abnormal or mutant autosomal recessive gene. And uh, I'm going to give you exa an example of what I mean. First, let me mention a few genetic diseases. An albino. Now, that's not the worst kind of disease there ever was. You know, somebody who's an albino, they can't make melanin. And these are the probabilities. One out of every 38,000 Caucasians has albinism, is an albino. One out of every 22,000 African Americans has, is an albino. You'll notice it's actually very prevalent among Hopi and Navajo Indians. I'm not asking you to know that, but it varies in different populations. In different populations, we find different genetic diseases more prevalent than in others. 
Un unfortunately, e every population in the world has, quote, their genetic diseases. So Italians, Scotch, Irish, Africans, whatever it is, Chinese, everybody's got their genetic diseases. Some are just more prevalent in different populations. So if, uh, if a particular population doesn't have this disease, they've got some other disease. Uh, anyhow, uh, so I do want you to know what albinism is. That's the inability to make melanin. Uh, cystic fibrosis is uh, primarily found in people of Scotch-Irish ancestry. You'll notice that one out of every 1,500 Caucasian Americans has, is born with cystic fibrosis. It's quite rare among African Americans. Not impossible, but one out of every 100, 125,000. Again, I'm not asking you to know the numbers. I'm just pointing out that cystic fibrosis is more common among, quote, whites than, uh, than uh, African Americans. Every, every group has their own diseases. What is cystic fibrosis? It's basically a problem in the lungs and the digestive tract where they fill up with a lot of mucus. Pretty strange disease, but uh, they're just a, a, this thick, gummy mucus clogs up their lungs and digestive tract. They have trouble absorbing nu nutrients. Mostly, they end up dying in their 20s because their lungs are all filled, clogged up and they can't breathe. Uh, Tay-Sachs disease, primarily individuals uh, of European Jewish ancestry, very rare among non-Jews. This is a defect in an enzyme in the brain. The child is born seeming normal, and they usually die by the age of two or three years old as their nervous system deteriorates. All right, but the example that I'll use just because People are familiar with it. I could use any of these examples. Any of these, all these genetic diseases work the same, but I'll use the example of sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is more common among individuals of African ancestry. Can it be found in people, other people? Yes, but it's less common. So let me explain, uh, and I'll use the example of sickle cell anemia. Let's return back. Uh, I'm going to go back to N6. <laughs> If you still have space on N6. If you still have space on N6. All right, so here's how I'd like to describe this. Let's, uh, let's talk about these genetic diseases. So let's say I'm going to use a capital letter N for a normal gene. A normal gene. And I'm going to use a small, which is dominant. That's dominant. Which is good. And I'm going to use a small letter N for the genetic disease. Genetic defect. Which is recessive. All right, so let's consider what the possibilities are. Somebody could inherit a normal gene from both parents. All right, so they're clearly normal. Totally normal. They could inherit a normal gene from one of the parents and a defective gene from the other. This is called a carrier of the genetic disease. This is a carrier of the genetic disease. They still have one normal gene, but they have inherited a defective gene. They're a carrier of the genetic disease. And what's the third possibility? They've inherited the defective gene from both parents. In that case, they have the genetic disease. All right, so now that we've seen the three possibilities, so let's give you an example. So I'm going to give you the most common example that happens. Let's imagine we have a man who is a carrier of a genetic disease. Maybe he's a carrier of sickle cell anemia. He's a carrier of cystic fibrosis. 
He's a carrier of being an albino. They all work the same. And he marries a woman, and she's also a carrier. She's also a carrier. So our question is, can these two carriers of the same genetic disease have a child with that genetic disease? Yes. yes. So let's see what the probability is. So I make these cute little chart. Okay. Half the sperm produced by the man carry the normal gene. Half the sperm produced by the man carry the defective gene. Same thing is true with the eggs from the woman. Half of her eggs carry the normal gene, and half of her eggs carry the genetic disease. So if the sperm carrying the normal gene unites with an egg with the normal gene, they're totally normal. If the sperm carrying the normal gene unites with an egg that's carrying the defective, right, the defective gene, then that child's a carrier, just like the parents. If this uh, sperm carrying the defective gene unites with an egg with the normal, again, we customarily write the capital letter uh, before the small letter. So again, it's a carrier. But what if the sperm carrying the defective gene unites with the egg carrying the defective gene? Now we have a genetic disease. So what is the probability of two carriers for the same genetic disease? Let's say it was sickle cell anemia. So the father is a carrier of sickle cell anemia. The mother, oops, sorry. when I was getting excited, or maybe not. All right, so it, here we have two carriers. The father is a carrier of the genetic disease, say sickle cell anemia, the mother's a carrier. They're both fine, they're carriers. So what's the probability of them having a child with the sickle cell anemia? One out of four, all right? So this is the most common pattern. The most common pattern we see with, with genetic diseases is where you have a husband and wife. They're both OK. And then they have a child who has the genetic disease. And they ask, how could it be? I'm OK. My spouse is OK. How is it possible we had a child with this genetic disease? And the answer is because they were both carriers of the genetic disease. That's usually because it catch, catches people off guard. If you know that you're marrying somebody who has a genetic disease, that's one thing. But usually you've got two people and they're both fine. They're both fine. They're carriers of the disease, but they're okay. So that usually takes everybody by surprise. The majority of genetic diseases work this way, where the, the good news is that the uh, normal gene is dominant. And, uh, and it's good that the ge defect is defective gene, the de genetic disease gene, is recessive. The only way you can have, either, have the genetic disease is if you inherited that defect from both parents. But when you have two carriers, there's a one in four chance that uh, you can have a, ch a child who has the disease. Uh -huh. Is there any way to determine if you are a carrier? Yes. Uh, and the, um, I think I've linked on the, the website the Human Genome Project, there are many, there's now over 300 different genetic diseases one can test for. But here's the, you know, the bottom line to be candid is most people when they fall in love, they don't say, you know, I'm all really in love with you. I love you more than anything in the world. Let's do genetic tests. <laughs> so usually you find out after you're already committed to the person. So you prob most of the time you're not going to go and you know, do that. Te now, it's, it, in terms of knowing for your own interest, that, that might be useful, just so you know. 
And uh, you know, if somebody does know that they are, it doesn't mean you can't marry them. There's a one in four chance. That means a three out of four chance the child's fine. You know, 75% is still pretty good odds, but you have to understand the way genetics works. Uh -huh. How about um, diabetes or high blood pressure? Are they work the same way? They're more complicated. It's not quite as straightforward. But there's no doubt that the majority of diseases have strong genetic factors. Diabetes runs in families. High blood pressure runs in families. The majority of things, even things like depression, can run in families. Cancer. Angelina Jolie, to use a topical example, is an example where the cancer runs in her family. So there are other factors. There are other environmental factors and so on, but we're increasingly seeing the importance of genetics. Uh -huh. I just want to say, in my family, my mother's a carrier. My father wasn't. Uh -huh. So they have six children. The third child is a carrier, which is my younger sister. She got with someone that she didn't know. They didn't know he was a carrier until uh -huh. they had their first child, who was a carrier. Right. And then they had two more children but their doctor explained to them that if you have the fourth one, you explained to her, there's a great chance you're fourth one. So they stop at the third there, there, There's no greater problem. Each time it's a one in four chance. Right. Each time, you know, it's like the chance of having a boy or a girl is one out of one out of two, you know, 50%. No matter how many boys you have, it's still 50-50. Because their Each. first child is a carrier. Yeah, that doesn't uh, two, affect uh -huh. the statistics. And then they, had two, and then they had two more children, and neither one of them carriers or anything. Yeah. It's, again, it works the, the way this works. It's easy to, easy to set up. When you're talking about a situation where uh, you say one of them has... The, well, both of my sister's a carrier and her husband's a carrier. All right, so it looks exactly like I described. And then their first child is a carrier. Right, so that there was... And it, it, incidentally, this these two carriers, there's a 50% chance they'll have children who are carriers. There's only a one in four chance that they're totally normal. And then their two last ones, they decided to stop from the third one. Yeah. They didn't want to All right, they figured they've, they've had run pretty good streak so far. And, so they only right. go for four. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, you know, just as a side note to all this, it, here, uh, just two quick things. First off, on page N8, on N8, so what I've been describing, you know, is look at this. So here you've got, here, this is just a, showing a similar idea in the form of a cartoon. So here's a, a dark-haired uh, a man and a dark-haired woman, and here they have this uh, toe-head daughter. And you'd say, how could that be? Who's been playing around with whom? <laughs> but you see that when you look into their, uh, their ancestry, we see that uh, it's, it's, it's more complicated. So they were both carriers of these li uh, lighter traits for lighter hair. So that's, you know, that's how these things appear. Uh, as I mentioned, there are genetic diseases in every ethnic group. So here you can see some of the high incidence disorders in Greeks and Italians and Albanians and in Africans and in Chinese and in Irish and in Japanese. You know, every single group, there are their genetic diseases that are more prevalent. Uh, another example of what we're saying is if on page N9. This is page N9. So I don't know if you're familiar with the royal families of Europe, but you know, the royal families of Europe, they've been marrying one another for a long time. You know, they've been marrying this cousin or that cousin, they're all related. And uh, a lot of them are actually ancestors of Queen Victoria. And so uh, what runs in the ancestry of Queen Victoria is hemophilia, the bleeder's disease. So uh, you'll notice, let's, let's show you this uh, family tree so you can see what we're talking about. Here, you re relate to this right here. Here's Prince Charles. Now this is a little bit older, so it doesn't show uh, William and Harry and all that. But in, in Britain, so Prince Charles, I think you know who he is. His, uh, wife, his mother is Queen Elizabeth II, who's married to Prince Philip. But you'll notice here, related to them, 
uh, is uh, here's the Prince Zygmunt of Prussia, and uh, over here is Juan Carlos of Spain, and uh, here is, uh, let's see, uh, we've got the uh, Nicholas II of Russia. All of these families are related. So the royal families in Russia and in Spain and in Germany and in Britain, they're all interrelated. And uh, they have certain genetic diseases that run in the family. And uh, the reason why you try to not marry somebody genetically really close to you is because they are more likely to be carriers of the same genetic disease. Does everybody follow that? So uh, it, th that's why almost all, all societies have rules not to marry a first cousin, so maybe okay on a second, or don't not to marry certain r relations, because the closer they, uh, they are related to you, the more likely you're carriers of the same genetic disease. Now, being uh, an example of this is, uh, 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 is uh, ancient Egypt. So, you know, in ancient Egypt, the pharaoh was viewed as a god. So he certainly couldn't marry a regular Egyptian. So uh, all, all the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ancestors of pharaoh would marry the other uh, royalty. So they have a high incidence, and they know this from the mummies they've studied, high incidence of uh, birth defects and so on, because they were just marrying within that same group. So uh, generally, the, uh, you try not to uh, marry uh, somebody close. The uh, term for that, I think I've it listed, is on N4, on N4, in the middle of the page. So this is called marriage between relatives or consanguineous marriage, which increases the probability of genetic diseases. So you can see that, uh, uh, that uh, the probability of different genetic problems is greater when you marry first cousins than when they're unrelated because it increases the pro probability that you're carriers of the similar genetic problems. All right, it's interesting that uh, the, the full s story of this is when you marry somebody who's more closely related, yes, you increase the bad traits. You also increase some of the real positive ones too because uh, you're increasing what are called recessive, both good and bad recessive traits. But uh, usually, whatever the good qualities are, are outweighed by the defects. Okay, I've just given you a touch on genetics. I'm going to switch gears now, and we're going to move into the home stretch with the last topics. So I want to move to page 03. All right, so on page 03... And I do have videos on this. So I'm skipping stuff, and whatever I skip, I'm not going to test you on. It's not that it's not interesting. It's not that it's unimportant. But uh, I'm purposely not trying to just throw everything I can at you the last week here. You'd say, it sure seems like it. Well, I'm not. OK. So I want to begin with what are tumors? So a tumor is a growth, an abnormal growth. It's when cells start to multiply in the body. So it's an increased mass of abnormal cells. And what's, gone, what's happened is that the cells have kind of gone out of control, and they start to undergo mitosis at a faster rate than normal. Remember, we had learned that there's mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis is the forming of new body cells. Meiosis is the formation of sex cells. We're not take, talking about forming of sex cells right now. We're forming, talking about forming of too many abnormal body cells. This is by increased rates of mitosis or cell division. <clears throat> okay, now, there are two major types of tumors. There are benign tumors and there are malignant tumors. A benign tumor is where there's an increased growth of uh, cells. 
The good news is that they're all staying in one place. So let's imagine that somebody had an increased mass of cells forming in their liver, or forming in their skin, or forming in their lung. The good news is, if there's a good news, is that there's an increased mass of these abnormal cells, but they're all staying in the liver. They're all staying in the lung. They're not going anywhere else. So why that's good is because the treatment is surgical removal of that tumor. So they will simply schedule, they'll say, let's schedule surgery and let's remove that tumor. If the good news is it's benign. The word benign means good. It's not great that you've got the tumor, but at least it's easy to remove. And after they remove it, maybe it will never come back again. Maybe it will never come back again. Maybe it will come back again, but at least it's all staying in one place. So it only requires surgery. So what is a malignant tumor? The word malignant means evil. Benign means good. Malignant means evil. An evil tumor is also known as cancer. In this case, there is not only an increased mass of cells, but why it's evil is because it's metastasizing. Metastasizing means it's spreading. So if somebody has a malignant tumor, an evil tumor in their liver, not only is it growing, but some of these abnormal cells, these malignant tumor cells, or we can call them cancer cells, are spreading out of the liver and spreading all over the body. And that makes it more difficult to treat because even if you remove the main tumor mass, the main mass, there's already microscopic malignant tumor cells or cancer cells that have already spread. And you've got to somehow kill those microscopic cancer cells that have already metastasized. So the treatment for a malignant tumor, a cancer, is first surgical removal of the mass and then use radiation or chemotherapy, sometimes both, to kill the cancer cells that have already metastasized. Now sometimes they'll change the order in which they do this. Sometimes they might do some radiation or chemotherapy even before they do the surgery, but it requires both. They have to do both things. <clears throat> so in this case, the problem is you have to do radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, or, and or chemotherapy in addition to the surgery. The problem with the radiation and chemotherapy is that what you're doing is you're doing something to kill cells. What you, you're doing it to kill the cancer cells, but in the process of killing these cancer cells, it makes your other normal cells also quite sick. So the treatment, the chemotherapy treatment or radiation treatment is very debilitating. So the chemotherapy or radiation can cause the person, to, the hair to fall out. It can cause them to become very weak. It can cause them to feel very uh, sick when they eat, very hard to eat and swallow. That's the result of the treatment because the treatment is trying to kill these cancer cells and it can also tends to uh, harm even the normal cells. Now the good news is it's reversible after you finish with the chemotherapy or radiation, then the body heals again and it's, and it's okay. But the treatment itself can be quite debilitating. Now, um, all right, so every, first of all, does everybody understand the difference between a benign tumor and a malignant tumor? All right, which is another way of saying cancer. All right, now the question, uh, as far as cancer, so how does it happen? It basically involves a normal cell that became a tumor cell, that became a cancer cell. This process of a normal cell in the body changing into a tumor or cancer cell is called transformation. So you have to have a normal cell transform or change into a cancer cell. Here, let's look at my picture here. It's an amazing picture. Okay, Maybe not so amazing. So we start with the normal cell it changes or is transformed into a cancer cell. And once it changes into a cancer cell, then it starts to multiply and spread. It increases in numbers, and it starts to metastasize or spread. 
So really, the real question in biology and in science has been, what's causing a normal cell to change into a tumor or cancer cell? That's really the question. What's causing this transformation? <clears throat> so in fact, there are about four major theories. Four major theories. So transformation of a normal cell to a cancer cell, one of the theories is genetic. Now, we've already been mentioning today the BRCA gene. Right? We mentioned there's an oncogene, a gene where if there's a defect, it increases the probability of having cancer. So this is where we know that some people have inherited defective genes, and it's only a matter of time before a, that, a, that normal cell becomes cancerous because there are oncogenes. There are cancer-causing genes in these cells. So when you inherit... When you inherit a defect in the DNA that's called an oncogene, it's only a matter of time before a normal cell becomes cancerous. Again, that's the basic situation with Angelina Jolie. She had inherited this defect of gene. They said there's almost a 90% probability that it's only a matter of time before these normal cells become cancerous. So rather than waiting for that to happen, she chose to preemptively basically uh, make it so that it couldn't happen. Um, okay, that's one theory. A second theory, exposure to mutagenic or carcinogenic agents. You'd say, what do you mean? Let me give you an example of ultraviolet rays from the sun. If you're exposed repeatedly over and over to harmful ultraviolet rays, we've learned that elect certain types of, uh, of uh, electromagnetic rays are very powerful and they can damage cells. They can damage the DNA in cells. They can cause genetic mutations. Now, we know that the radiation that's the worst is gamma rays. Not quite as bad are x-rays. And what can even cause some damage are ultraviolet rays. Now, ultraviolet rays cannot penetrate very deep. They can only penetrate our skin cells. But when people get repeated exposure to ultraviolet rays, especially if they are fairer skinned, that have less melanin, less shielding to protect them against harmful ultraviolet rays, it's only a matter of time before these ultraviolet rays damage, mutate the DNA in those skin cells and those normal cells will change or transform into skin cancer cells. So skin cancer, which is the most common of all cancers, actually, is, is primarily occurs because of too much ultraviolet exposure, especially in people with fair skin. All right? So really, why anybody, especially who's fair skin, would live in a place like Palm Springs, I have no idea. Because they're basically setting themselves up with all that ultraviolet rays in Palm Springs all the time to get enough, uh, too much ultraviolet exposure and cause skin cancer. So it's very prevalent in Palm Springs. Uh, the good news about skin cancer is that you usually catch it pretty early because you can see there's something clearly wrong on the skin, so they catch it usually pretty early. But they have to remove that part of the skin that's become cancerous. All right, so uh, there are many things that can cause genetic mutations or cause cancer. Not only can ultraviolet rays or x-rays, so can chemicals. There are chemicals in our food, chemicals in the air that we breathe, chemicals in the water we drink that, that are said to be carcinogenic <laughs> chemicals, cancer-causing chemicals. They cause normal cells to transform into cancer cells. So that's another theory. Now, these are not mutually exclusive. OK, a third theory. Exposure to a non-lytic virus. What's a non-lytic virus? We're going to tell you more about this next time, but a non-lytic virus is a vi virus that enters a cell and becomes part of your genetic code. It enters the nucleus of the cell and attaches to your chromosomes. So it becomes a non-lytic virus, which is made out of DNA, becomes part of the host's chromosomes, your chromosomes. 
And that alters your, the genetic code in that cell, causing what was a normal cell to now, once that virus is now part of the, in the nucleus of that normal cell, now that normal cell is transformed into a cancer cell. So what's an example of that, where a virus can cause a normal cell to become cancerous? Actually, an example we learned a long time ago, the human papillomavirus. The human papillomavirus, HPV, has now been found to be an example of this where it can enter the cells of uh, the cervix, the lower part of the uterus, and it can cause those normal cells of the uterus to become cancerous cells. And, that's and it can cause cervical cancer, type of cancer of the uterus. So that's why we had learned a long time ago, when we were talking about scientific theories and so on and hypotheses, so they've developed a vaccine against the human papillomavirus. So uh, if one is sexually active with many people, you are increasing your risk of possibly contracting that virus. And therefore, if you contract that virus, it can enter the cells during sexual intercourse and increase the risk of cervical cancer. So get vaccinated against that virus. All right, so that, that's an example. There are other viruses that they think similarly can cause uh, cancer. All right, so there's, uh, before I mention the fourth one, let me just summarize the first three. So what do the uh, theory number one, theory number two, and theory three have in common? They have one thing in common. There's been a change in the genetic code. Either you inherited a defect in the DNA, that was the first case, or you were exposed to something that altered the DNA, like ultraviolet rays or some carcinogenic chemical, or you were exposed to a virus that attached to your DNA. So what all three have in common is a change is occurring in the genetic code, in the DNA of that cell. So again, this explains why cancer research has been very tightly bound up with DNA research. Well, I'll mention the four theory next time. We'll stop here, and next time we'll try to finish off the uh, cancer thing and talk about the immune system and a few last things.